Good morning. morning. It is great to be gathered together in the name of Jesus as we continue to celebrate the resurrection and hopefully we continue to celebrate the resurrection throughout the entire year together because Christ is risen. risen Amen and hallelujah. As we gather together this morning, there's a few things that uh, you might notice about our stage that are a little bit different. The first is that we gather together and enjoy uh, bringing our offering to to the Lord, and part of our offering this morning is our food drive. Uh, Our food drive actually ends uh, at the end of the day today. We're bringing all the food tomorrow, so uh, if you haven't had a chance to bring food and still would like to do that, you can do so today and leave it uh, downstairs by the door. And we are very, very excited about uh, partnering with the Glen Ellen Food Pantry this morning. There's also another thing on our stage that we are very excited about, and that is a white rose signifying new life. Uh, And I'm so pleased and uh, joyous to announce that Declan Eric Sveen was born on Friday morning to Daniel and Amy Sveen. So we are celebrating uh, with Daniel and Amy for the birth of their uh, first baby boy. Very, very exciting time for them. And we worship with them uh, and join them in their joy. Uh, And joy is what we're celebrating during this season, the joy of the resurrection, the joy that Paul had as he wrote his letter to the Philippians. And so as we enter into worship today, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you with great joy because this is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and are glad in it. We rejoice in your promises to us that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We rejoice that because he lives, we too also may live. God, we pray that you would be glorified this morning through our hearts, our minds, our lips, our bodies. And that through the Holy Spirit, you would encourage us and that you would awaken in us a desire to serve you and walk with you more closely. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Would you stand for our call to worship? Come and see Jesus. Are you afraid? Are you suffering? Jesus is here with us, as real as when he walked into the room where his disciples were gathered after his resurrection and said, Come and touch Jesus. Do you have doubts? Questions? Jesus' nail wounds in his hands and spear wounds in his side are as real today as when Thomas, one of his disciples, touched him and exclaimed, My Lord and my God, come and believe in Jesus. We can trust Jesus with everything in our lives. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. Prisoners, now we're running free. Cause we all 
forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, now we're running free. And we are forgiven. Listen and respond to the words of Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. You refused to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. You have, you have turned, turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have, you have taken, taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed, clothed me with joy, that, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Joyful, joyful. joy today and we declare it and we proclaim it together as we join our voices as one people 
in praying to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us greet one another in Jesus' name. Hey, Everly. Right, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the hearing of God's word this morning. I'm going to invite Judy to come up and read from Philippians. Our scripture reading is found in Philippians 1, verses 12 through 26. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I des desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, God, that it may be to us a lamp unto our feet, Lord, that you would help us, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand and respond to what you have for us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing our series in Philippians, and we're looking at joy, and some form of joy or rejoicing is mentioned in our text three times this morning. And it's quite interesting because it is joy in the midst of a tough reality. 
If you remember from last week is our introduction that Christ, or, or that Paul, sorry, Paul is in prison. And we heard it this morning in the, in the text that he is in chains for Christ. And so this morning we'll be focusing on that reality. In fact, we'll be focusing on a reality, two attitudes of Paul's, and underlying strengths beneath those attitudes. A reality, two attitudes, and the underlying strength beneath those attitudes. So the reality we've already said is that Paul is in chains for the gospel. Why is Paul in chains? Why is Paul in chains? If you're a child and you're sitting in here this morning, I want you to think about a chain, like maybe a, a chain on a, on a swing set or something. You see those links? It says that Paul is in chains, in chains for the gospel, that he's in chains for Jesus. Why is he in chains? I would think chains are something that you give to a bad guy. But Paul is in chains. And actually, if you want to know why Paul's in chains, you can you could turn to Acts 23 through 28. We're not going to do that. That's five chapters of Acts. We're not going to do that. But in Acts 23 to 28, we see Paul before the authorities and the governors of the Jewish people and the authorities and governors of Rome in the provinces of uh, Israel and Jerusalem and Judea. And we see something rather interesting, in my opinion. So first off, Paul has a mission. If you remember from the book of Acts that Paul actually goes on three missionary journeys. And if you turn to the back of your Bible, most Bibles in the back of their Bible, they have a map that says a map of Paul's missionary journeys. And it actually looks like a Mario Kart go-kart track. And it happens three times. In Mario Kart, you usually have to do three laps and Paul is doing real-life Mario Kart. He's doing it all throughout Judea and Samaria, and he's, he's doing it up into Asia, and he goes into Macedonia, and you see this happening. And actually, it's interesting because as Paul does this, he's setting up the churches, he's proclaiming the news of Jesus Christ, setting up the churches, and the first one he goes a little bit, the second one he goes a little bit further, and the third one he goes back to all those places to encourage them. And by the end of the third one, he finds himself in, uh, in Caesarea. And when he's in Caesarea, he's brought before the authorities because the Jewish people are so upset with him because he's causing a ruckus. Because people are starting to put their faith in Jesus. That people are starting to say that Jesus is the Son of God. He's proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah and he's throwing everything into a hullabaloo. And so they put him in front of the authorities, and I think Paul has an idea. Because if we remember that he's written a letter to the Romans, and in his letter to the Romans, he says, I long to visit you. I want to bring the gospel to Rome. Rome is the center of the known world. And then he says to them in Romans that he wants to bring the gospel not just to Rome, but to Spain. So if you think about Europe in your mind, he's thinking about bringing the gospel to Rome, and then he's going to continue to go west, and he's going to go into Spain. And now, in, in Acts 23 through 28, we see him before the governors, and the governors are telling him, we are going to send Paul back to Jerusalem to put him on trial with the Jewish people because he hasn't done anything wrong in Roman law. And I think Paul is smart. Paul is a Roman citizen as well as a Jew. And so Paul says to the people who are going to, that are putting him on trial and are going to send him back to Jerusalem, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And they're not allowed to send him back to Jerusalem to put him on trial under a Jewish trial because he's a Roman citizen. And so Paul is actually, I think, so clever. He's like, I'm going to go to jail because they're going to take me to Rome. And I'm going to go to Rome on the Roman dollar. They're going to transport me there as a prisoner. <laughs> he's so incredibly intelligent in the way that he goes about this. And now he's in prison. So his reality is that he's in Rome and he is in prison. And maybe his chains weren't so surprising to him. Now, this reminds me, if you're a kid, of Capture the Flag. Because at times, if you're a child and you're playing Capture the Flag, at times you want to be captured so that you can go to jail and you can look for the flag on the other side. Am I right? Anybody here ever played Capture the Flag? That's what we did. And that's what Paul is doing, you guys. Paul is like, hey, I'm going to go to jail for Jesus. And they're going to send me to Rome. And I'm going to be able to preach the gospel in the center of the universe. 
the center of the known world. But Paul's imprisonment looks much different than most jail time. Number one, Paul is in jail in a house. He's under house arrest. And what we know about this is that um, he's allowed to have visitors. So people can come and see him. And he's been teaching people about Jesus. He can have visitors that come to his house. So he's had Jewish people coming and saying, what is this? this message that you're proclaiming. He has Gentiles that are coming that are wanting to know what he's talking about. But the whole time, and this is another interesting thing about Paul's imprisonment, that the whole time Paul is chained to a Roman soldier. He actually has a chain link that would go from his hand to a Roman soldier's hand so that he cannot escape. This was a common practice in Rome. It was a common practice to chain a prisoner to a guard, especially if that prisoner was an important person, so that they cannot get away and you cannot lose this person. So the reality is that Paul is chained to another person at all times, and he is in jail. But Paul's imprisonment became the medicine of courage to the Christian men and women in the city of Philippi. It became an encouragement to them. And the question is, why was his imprisonment so encouraging? Why does he tell people to be encouraged by his imprisonment? It's because of his attitudes. I want to look at two attitudes of Paul in here. The first attitude that is joyful, a joyful attitude, number one, I believe comes from verse 18. If you look at Philippians 1, verse 18, it says this, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The me- Paul's attitude is that the message of Christ is everything to him. The message of the gospel is everything. In fact, it was everything because he was willing to go to jail for it. And he knew that while he was in jail, that he would be able to proclaim that message and that it would go out into Rome. He even says that the entire praetorium, uh, and that could be a place or it could be a group of people, but whatever it is, that his message is going out into these Roman citizens. And what I think is fascinating is that Paul's person that he's chained to wasn't the same guy every time. I mean, we can't, you can't imagine that. That guy's not going to be in jail with Paul all the time. But it was a rotating, probably, group of people. And as Paul is describing the gospel to other people, he's got all these Roman guards that are sitting there chained to him, and they're hearing it. And he says that the gospel is starting to be proclaimed, and people are starting to believe in the gospel throughout the Roman guard. It's this incredible evangelistic strategy by Paul. But then he says something interesting, that while he's in prison, that there are people who are preaching Christ, who are hearing it, hearing about it, that they're emboldened by his imprisonment and and his message, and they're emboldened to preach Christ, and that some people are preaching out of selfish ambition, and some people are preaching from the right motives. And this is kind of a confusing statement by Paul. I don't think Paul is talking about people who are preaching false doctrine or uh, something bad. Paul is talking about people who are actually preaching the correct message of Jesus with false pretext or with the wrong motives. And actually, the word that's used for selfish ambition is a word that's meant for pay. And this is where you're like, wow, well, we're paying you. (laughs) I'm being paid. Um, It's a little bit awkward. But what Paul is talking about is there's, he's talking about people that actually, during this time, started to preach the message of the gospel and were using it to their own advantage. They were using it to create a career. Someone who, uh, as one scholar put it, said that they were, this, this became known as a term when people would canvas for office. It's the same term. So Paul says that they're using it to promote themselves in the society. And Paul's kind of upset about it. And they were using Paul's imprisonment to their own advantage. And I think that there's something here for us in this attitude. Because Paul says at the end, well, what does it matter? Who cares? Christ is being preached in pretense or in truth. The gospel is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Paul doesn't care who gets the credit He cares that the gospel is preached. He doesn't care if he gets the credit for somebody else's message. If it's the same message he's preaching, he doesn't care. Paul didn't care what other preachers and ministers said about him. He didn't care if they critiqued him because there were people that hated Paul. 
They didn't, he didn't care if they, they critiqued him. He cared that the gospel was preached. All too often, we resent it when someone else gains distinction and we do not. And Paul is here saying these people are gaining distinction and maybe for the wrong motives, and I don't care. All too often, we regard someone as an enemy because they simply are expressing some sort of criticism of us or our methods. Instead of being like, hey, they're succeeding and the gospel is being preached. All too often, we think that other people can do no good because they don't do things our way. Paul, in this, is actually addressing the differences of ways of proclaiming the gospel. That church's music doesn't sit right with me, so I don't really think I'm going to go there. Another church's children's program is better than this one. That church does a better job discipling than this church. That church does this. That person does this. I don't really like the way that that guy preaches. I don't really like the way that that guy stands while he preaches or moves his arms while he preaches. I don't really like this or this or this about that church. I don't really like this or this or this about that author. And Paul is like, no, it doesn't matter. Christ is preached. And we have something to learn from this. There are people who are bad-mouthing Paul's methods, and he says, I don't care. I have incredible joy that the message of Christ is being preached. And this is really important today, because we tend to think that if we disagree with someone, that we can no longer be in fellowship with them. And it is destroying the church. And Paul says, don't do that, even in this letter. He doesn't want them to do that. Now, here's a caveat in all of this. And the caveat is this, that he doesn't care about the motive behind the message, but he cares a lot about the message. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3, he says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That what is Paul's gospel? What is this message? That Christ died according to the scriptures. And it actually doesn't say he just died. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and the apostles. And he goes on to say the different ways that he appeared. So this is Paul's message. He cares a lot about that. He doesn't care about the, the, the means that it gets across, the motives that it gets across, but he cares about the message. And the message is the person Jesus, his atoning sacrifice for sin, his death, his resurrection that was bodily. This is everything. If you take this out, we miss the point. This is why Paul is in chains. And his attitude is this message is so important. The second attitude of Paul is this. It comes from verse 21. He says this. It's summed up in a really, really great way. One of the greatest uh, verses in all of the New Testament, in my opinion, is Paul says in verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And his attitude is that our desire should be heaven, while our mission is here. Our desire should be heaven, while our mission is here. He says to them, I know through your prayers and through the Spirit of Christ that this will turn out for my deliverance. Deliverance. Is Paul talking about an earthly deliverance or is he talking about a heavenly deliverance? And we see in this little passage that, that follows this that he's talking about both. That he's talking about his earthly deliverance and his heavenly deliverance. That to live would be Christ and to die is gain. That if he died, he would be with Jesus. And if he lived, he would have joyful fruit in his life to share the message of the gospel. And so he's torn He's torn between the two. He says, I can't decide what's better. I can't decide what to do. I can't wait to be with Jesus. It's like he's writing to them, and he's like thinking about being with Jesus in heaven. And you guys, I don't know about you, but if you think about being with Jesus in heaven, the first thing I think about is I want to just smell him. <laughs> don't you wonder what Jesus smells like? 
I can't wait to run up to Jesus and give him a hug. And I imagine he's going to be wearing a white robe. He might not be. I don't know what he's going to be wearing. But I want to put my face in his chest and I want to smell what Jesus smells like. I can't wait. I can't wait. It makes me think of like when I was a kid and I washed my hands in second grade with the orange dial soap. Anytime I smell orange dial soap, I think of second grade. And I have these good memories of second grade. I want to know what that memory smell is like. And Paul is saying this. He says, I'm torn. I, I long to depart. I actually long to depart this world and be with Jesus. But his conclusion this, is that it is more necessary for them that he remains. Paul has this great desire for heaven, but he knows that his mission is now, and he's not going to lose that mission now. And look what he says. His situation is grave indeed. He's in jail but that his situation will turn out for his good because God is glorified and others are encouraged. He says to them, in verse 24, he says, it is, oh, I'm still in Corinthians, sorry. He says, but to remain in the flesh, in my body, to be alive, is more necessary on your account. It's more necessary for me to live for you. And he does this awesome thing in verse 25 that you don't catch in the English translation, but he uses it. If Paul was a Greek rapper, he'd be really good because he uses these cool word plays. He actually uses this Greek phrase, meno kaiperomeno. It like kind of rhymes. Meno kaiperomeno. He says, convinced of this, that it's more necessary that I stay alive for you. He says, I know that I will meno kaiperomeno, which is I will remain and continue with you that I will remain and walk beside you, that I will remain and continue along with you. And I think what we have in this is a reality that if we want to be with Jesus, but our mission is now, my question is, who is benefiting from you being here right now? Who is benefiting from you being here? Not only that, how is my attitude in the face of suffering resulting in someone else's progress and joy in their faith. Maybe it's someone you're chained to. I'm serious. Not in a bad way. Mothers, how is your attitude in the face of your suffering, which sometimes being a mom is tough, how is your attitude in the face of your suffering for the progress and joy of your children's faith? Those of you who are chained to somebody at work, that you're like, I don't really like being chained to this person. How is your attitude in that situation benefiting the progress and joy of their faith? Whether or not they believe in Jesus. For those of you who are children, who are sometimes feel like you're chained to mom and dad. Maybe you're an adult child. And you feel chained to mom and dad. Maybe you're an adult, you're a, ch a parent of an adult child. How is your attitude in your current situation benefiting the people who you are with for their progress and joy in Jesus? Maybe it's an aging parent or a spouse that you're not getting along with or a sibling children, brothers, sisters, mommy or daddy. Maybe it's someone at school or a teacher or a friend or somebody who is telling you they need you and it's finals week and you need to study. But verse 25 and 26 from Paul, he says, I am convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Meno kaipera meno. That I will remain and continue for your progress in the joy and joy in the faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And we learn later that it ends up being, uh, that, that ends up being the first thing. When Paul is like, I'm torn between the two, whether I'm going to leave or whether I'm going to remain in the flesh. And he's telling them, I, I, I'm going to remain for you. And we realize later that actually it's the first. That Paul doesn't get out of jail that Paul is killed, that Paul dies for the sake of the gospel. 
But in so doing, Philippi, the church in Philippi, the church is throughout all of Macedonia in that Mario Kart race that he had been going through. They're encouraged and the gospel is proclaimed. So my question in all of this, so those are his two attitudes. My question in all of this is what is the underlying strength behind those attitudes? Because if you're going to have an attitude about something, it better come from somewhere. It's not like you're just going to muster it up and do it. And so two, these will be quicker things. But there, I think there's two underlying things that Paul has in his attitudes uh, towards uh, th that he's giving to the Philippians in this reality of being in jail. There's two things, and they found if we look back in verse, uh, in verse 19. He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. The first is the prayer of other people. Paul is continually, continually asking for the prayers of others. In 1 Thessalonians 5.25, he says, Beloved, pray for us. 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us, so that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified. 2 Corinthians 1.11, You must help us by your prayers. Philemon 1.22, he says to Philemon, Hey, pre pre prepare a room for me, because I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously delivered unto you. Romans 15.30, I appeal to you, Roman church, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in prayer in your prayers to God on my behalf. When someone asks you, hey, can I pray for you? Don't ever again say to them, I don't have anything for you. We should always be entreating the prayers of others. That Christ may be glorified in us. If somebody asks you, how can I pray for you? Just say, will you pray that Christ is glorified in me? Because that covers everything. If you get sick and somebody's praying that Christ is glorified in you, if Christ is glorified in you while you're sick, it means you're going to have the right attitude. And it might mean that you are healed. If Christ is glorified in you and while you're at work, oh man, that Christ is glorified in me is the best thing for others to pray for me. And I promise you that the prayers of others lift us up in every situation. I was just with Fern Williams this last week, praying for her last weekend, and I visited her and I said, Fern, your church is praying for you. And she started weeping. She started weeping because she said to me, I feel strengthened. And I believe that she feels strengthened because her church is praying for her. The underlying strength of the attitude of Paul comes from the prayers of people. That should encourage us to pray for others, and it should encourage us to ask others to pray for us. The second is the Holy Spirit. He says, verse 19, For I know that through your prayers, and with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And we see this through the Holy Spirit motif that Paul's reliance on the Holy Spirit, it is a motif throughout the entire book of Philippians. And we'll see it. In fact, I believe that it is Paul's final punch in Philippians 4 is this idea that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives him the strength. Philippians 4, 13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is not a, uh, a pump-up verse for a soccer game. It is actually, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in the sense that God's Spirit helps me in my need. That God's Spirit is the one who helps me to be content when I am lacking. And it is the motif throughout the entire thing that it is Christ's Spirit in us that gives us the attitude that we need. And he says that it is his eager expectation and hope through the Spirit that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. There's a famous theologian from the 19th century, Charles Ellicott, and he says this, my body will be the theater in which Christ's glory is displayed. My body will be the theater in which Christ's glory is to be displayed. Kids, if you're in here, have you ever been in a play before or tried to put a play on for your mom and dad? When you put a play on for your mom and dad, you are displaying a character. And Paul is saying that in my body, Christ's glory may be revealed, that we play a character. 
that we play the character of Christ. Your body is the theater in which Christ's glory is displayed. What part are you playing? Who is benefiting from being chained to you? Who are you praying for? Who are you sacrificing for? Do they see Christ in you or not? I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for Paul, for this man who, in the middle of being torn for his desire for Jesus and his love for the world and encouragement for those who are in the world to hear the message of Jesus, that he was willing to remain in chains, that he was willing to endure whatever you had for him so that the gospel, that Christ died to save sinners, and that he rose again to show us that his promises are yes, that he was willing to endure chains for that gospel message. Heavenly Father, I pray for those uh, who are not with us this morning. I pray for Fern. I pray for those who are worshiping with us from home. I pray that for those who are here, that you would strengthen them by your spirit so that our lives may be the theater in which Christ's glory is displayed. We cannot do it without your spirit. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would change us from the inside out. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's our sacred privilege now to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We have up here the food from our food drive. We did that on purpose because uh, as Leslie and I were talking about this service we realize that, you know, Paul is torn between these two things. He's torn between being with Christ and he's torn between benefiting others. We realize in this, this beautiful picture that Christ, who offers his body to us, the bread of life, and says, eat my body, who says, drink this cup, that it is because of this food that we do this food for others that we feed on Christ, that he invites us to come to this table, that he invites us to experience and taste his grace. And it is free grace. Anyone that would want to follow Jesus and repent of their way of sin is invited to come to this table. It does not matter if you've had a week where you've sinned a lot or you've sinned a little. We are all invited by Christ. Come to taste his grace and to experience the bread of life. Hear the words of our Apostle Paul. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you pray with me? God of all grace, will you send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may nourish us in faith. Draw us into unity with Christ and with one another. And Holy Spirit, would you abide in us until that day when we will feast joyfully with you at the coming of your kingdom. Amen. Friends, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body because we all partake in the one loaf. And is not the cup that we bless a participation in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts through faith and with thanksgiving. I'll invite our servers to come forward. And as they come forward, uh, just a few of our instructions. We know that there are children here in our service this morning. So 
as, as they are uh, here. If, if you're not taking communion for any reason, uh, we have grapes here, and you can come up and receive a grape. Uh, children, if you would like to receive a grape, Miss Crystal, are you doing the grapes? You can come up and receive a grape from Miss Crystal. And if, uh, if for any reason you would like to uh, receive a touchless option for communion, uh, you can come forward and just to the right, there's uh, some, some prepackaged communion that you can take. Please take the communion and bring it back to your seat and we'll take the cup and the juice together. And we also have our offering up here that you can leave an offering. If you have an offering this morning, we thank you for... Uh, supporting the work of the Lord through the ministry of Glen Allen Covenant Church. And if you need a gluten-free option for any reason, Sam will have that. This is Sam. This is Sam and Olivia. They're here. They're college students of ours, and uh, they signed up to serve communion this morning as the last day that our college students are with, with us, which is pretty cool. But Sam can get you a gluten-free option if you need that. Um, so the table is set. Christ is our host. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good.
Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ 
shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you with thanksgiving. Thank you for the celebration of the communion table that unites us as your body, reminding us of the unbelievable sacrifice of our Savior to redeem us from darkness. And so we are able to gather today in your light and be led by your Holy Spirit. And through your spirit, we desire to bless others. So we thank you for the bounty of food placed on the altar this morning. Bless this food and those who will be serving it to those in need. May the recipients of these gifts know how much you love and care for them and desire to share in their burdens. Lord Jesus, we are aware of the suffering in our world and feel helpless in alleviating it. But you are the almighty God, our refuge and our shelter. You are always present and you hear our prayers. Please minister to the victims of war, especially in Ukraine. Please stamp out the evil. Protect the persecuted and the oppressed. Convict and change the hearts of the oppressors. Care for victims of disasters and bless those that come to their rescue. Lord Jesus, there are those who are lonely and isolated because of age, illness, and separation from family. We pray your healing touch and comfort and provision of fellowship. We also pray for our government and leaders that they will do your will, whether they believe in you or not. Our country desperately needs you. Forgive us for denying you and pushing you away. We ask for your peace to reign and for you to remove all hostility and deceit. And Jesus, as the close of the school year approaches, may our students finish well and safely. May they know how much they are loved and cherished by you and that you have plans tailor-made for them. May they know you would never leave or forsake them. So we ask, Father, that we will be encouraged in heart and united in love. Amen. Uh, we have a, just a couple of announcements that we'd like you to know about as we move into our life and community. There's a, a, quite a few things going on that, that we want to make you aware of. The first is that we have a potluck immediately after our service today, just downstairs. Um, everybody's invited. We'd love for you all to come down uh, to enjoy food and fellowship together. But we're also doing it uh, this, this month for a purpose, and that is we're doing two things. We're saying farewell to our college students uh, who, for most of them, this will be the last Sunday that they're here, at least until next year, um, and we'll wait, await their return in the fall. And we're also saying thank you uh, to all of our volunteers. Um, last week was the last week of Sunday school, so there's no Sunday school today. Uh, we'll be doing the potluck during the Sunday school hour, but we're also uh, going to be thanking our volunteers. I think we have a cake down there in honor of that. Um, so please, please join us. We also would like for you to... Uh, 
if, if possible, we, or we wanted to thank the people who were here on Saturday for the All Church Work Day. Um, if you see that there's been a lot of mulch that was spread throughout our church grounds, um, but also that there's a few more piles of mulch left, uh, and that's because it started raining um, and was kind of a crummy day, and we were a little bit shorthanded. Um, and so we're, we're asking if anybody is, can or if they want to, if they'd like to stay after the potluck and just help spread a few piles of mulch, right, Tim? Is, there's, there's a few. I mean, yeah, a few-ish. Uh, so if, if you've got the time and the energy, uh, we'd love for a little bit more help this afternoon. Uh, so in honor of our college uh, students, that this is their last day, and in honor of all of our volunteers, Crystal, you want to come on up here and... and Crystal and I are going to just, we want to lead a, a, a moment of just thanking and sendi- sending our college students and thanking our volunteers. So um, if you're a college student here, will you just stand if you're college age, even if you're not a college student, if you're college age and you've been with us for uh, a while, we would like for you to stand. Um, we're just so thankful for you in our community, um, and we want to be a church that encourages you all as you prepare for your life as an adult. Um, and also stay standing. And if you have served or volunteered in any capacity, uh, we are also asking you to stand. If you volunteered or served in any capacity, I don't think this is on. Let me. Can you hear me? <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? No? Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Oh. Okay, I'll ask again. If you volunteered or served in the church in any capacity, will you please stand? Awesome. This is great. We're so thankful. Um, we could praise God for our college students and for those who have served and volunteered. Um, and we're uh, just going to pray for you right now. And we're going to pray for you. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the church, that you have established the church on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has proclaimed that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And God, I'm thankful that you equip people to lead in the church. God, I thank you for our volunteers who have so faithfully served throughout this whole year in many capacities in many ways. Lord, I pray that they would experience the joy of their serving you. And God, we also thank you for the the presence of our young adults, college students in our midst. We pray that as they enter into finals week this week, that you would bless them richly. Lord, we pray that you'd give them energy as they study hard. And God, we pray that you would bless them throughout this summer. Uh, as they go to their various places away from us. Lord, we, uh, we send them uh, as a community of believers, hoping that you will preserve them, knowing that you will uh, strengthen them, and for those that are coming back, knowing that you will return them to us. Uh, we praise you for our college students. We praise you for the community and the fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand as we sing together and send one another? be known by our love, let every word and every deed honor the Son, and a light shine in every eye, let us be known by our love, oh, the glory. 
love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever as you go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.